Okay. Now, because I think this tree is a little bit big for my rib line, I'm going to cheat. Now, what I'm going to talk about is a couple little odd things, nothing big and special. Maybe I should start. My name is Blackie Thomas for anybody who hasn't met me before. Okay? Now, one of the ways that I carry paracord, ridge lines, and things like that in my pack is like this in the daisy chain. All it is, I just sit there and camp whenever I got nothing better to do and I hook it together. The reason I do this is this does not knot up easy in the pack. And when I need to hook a line, I just grab and pull. And I got lines. That easy. Now, I'm going to run a ridge line across here, but I'm not sure that I got enough. So I'm going to go ahead and anchor to this one and make me a loop around it just to have a handy loop. Right now, I'm just going to hook it out like this for just in case. Like that. Now, and I got nice and bright pink so you can see what I'm doing. This tells me that this is a ridge line. You know, by looking a pack or whatever. How many times have you created a ridge line and then found it in the pack later on and cut it up because you thought it was just extra cord? Yep. Guilty. <laughs> Got tired of making ridge lines. So I went ahead and what I use is either a bright green or something like that. And this one is for demonstration. And when I pull it out of my pack, I can look at it and say, that's a ridge line. On the end of my ridge line, I put a big bowline. The bowline is big enough for the whole wad to pass over, okay? So when I walk up to a tree and I go and flip it around right quick, all I gotta do is just pass it through it like that and pull and I'm ready to go to the other end. That simple. Now, suppose I don't want to use this kind of knot for whatever reason. I want something that is quick and easy to disconnect from this end. Down here in our beloved south, we have intense storms that are rolling off the gulf. And when that happens, when you've got a nice tight ridge line up here, and when trees start doing this, and it's wet, that line will get so tight, those knots will get so tight, you can't untie it. So if I think I may have to be having bad weather, on this end I'm not going to put any kind of knot that I can't get out easily and quickly. I'll use a timber hitch. What a timber hitch is, simply, is this. The line's gonna come around the tree like this. Let's say I want my ridge line to go to where Donnie is. I'm gonna go over, come back under, and then I'll take this loop and just wrap it around that line three or four times. We're gonna say four. Put my thumb in that loop, okay? Now I'm going to pull it snug, hold on to that, and then pull it tight. See that loop still right there that I just generated? Now no matter how tight this gets, how tight I pull, that ain't going to come off that tree because it's fighting to itself through those loops. But to get it off, all I got to do is grab that loop and pull. It's going to fall off the tree. Let me demonstrate that one more time. Come up here. We'll throw us over the top, we'll come over here on the side, and I'm going to loop that over four times, making sure I kind of spread it down the tree a little bit. Okay? Get that last one, I'll put your thumb in it, and I'll put it back there, and I'm going to pull until it starts to bite up, and I'm going to let go. Now, woo, woo, that <laughs> good knot head slip. Get it. Keep all my paracord. Yeah. One. <laughs> Two, three, four. That part of the tree is up there. This tree's got a holla on this bark right there. I can stick my finger in there. That's it. Ugh. That ain't going nowhere. Even in that tight, it's going to fall off the tree. So that's the first trick. If I need something quick disconnect, the timber hitch is quick and easy. If not, I'm just going to run it around and run it through that loop. For the sake of this, I'm going to make another timber hitch right quick. Don't worry, I know you can't see it because I'm going to run the ridge line now. Like that. Just like that. All right. 
Now I got two dangly. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Come over here to mother end. Do I have enough? I think I need to go around this tree actually. I only run about 20 feet of ridge line. Okay. Now, I want this tight. So I'm gonna put a trucker's hitch in here. Just like this. But I'm going to run that through that loop one time. This is a trucker's hitch. If I run there twice through the same loop, like that, that's a truck E hitch. The difference is now when I pull it, it will lock into itself and hold it. So it holds the tension. <laughs> to break it, all I do is put my thumb between those two loops and spread it. So now I can pull it a ridge line blood tight and don't have to worry about it coming loose. Now what this knot is very useful for, truck E knot, simple trucker's hitch pulls, I think it's three times the pull of it because you're using a compound leverage. It acts like a pulley system. Going through the second time causes it to lock. Now, I pull this line. Get it not here because that fat, fat thing. I pull it tight. Once I get it tight, I'm just going to pinch it and put a half inch right behind it and pull it up snug. Now it can't slide up. I got a tight ridge line. What else this knot is good for? I have to move something big and heavy. For whatever reason, there's a log across the road and I gotta move it. <coughs> I can hook a line, do this kind of knot up there, <laughs> put a toggle on my rope and put my body weight on it. And with my 200 pounds of weight, I can generate almost 600 pounds of pull. I can move things. With three lines of paracord, I pulled my car back up in the road before because I could get that much torque on it. So with that truck E, it also locks. So if I slipped or whatever, it don't take off and run back. It's locking. It gives me that moment to tie my knot, whatever. Now, up here on my line, I have two proof knots that I leave up here that I have tied a toggle into the thing out of course. What these are for is for putting a tarp on quickly. Now, all I have to do, slide it out, take that line and make a loop, go through the grommet, and take that toggle, come over the top, and stick it through the loop. That's it. Now when it pulls tight, this toggle can't pull sideways through that hole, so it's going to anchor. So again, make a loop, stick the loop through the grommet, come over the top, stick it in there. In this case, I'm just going to put half of it through there, and now I can pull it tight. Just like that. Now notice how these proof knots lock on their own. So I pull them, and they stay locked on their own. To adjust it, all I got to do is just grab an eye and slide it. But once it's under tension, it locks. And this gives me the versatility I can scoot this tarp forward or back on this line without having to untie any knots. I'm going to sling a hammock up up under here, let's say. And when I put it in and I set it up tonight, the wind was coming from this direction with a little bit of light rain. During the night, let's say, it changes where it's coming from this direction. It's now blowing under this end. I can just step up here and slide my tarp up that way. All I gotta do is grab this one and slack it. Walk to this one, pull it up, walk back, pull it tight. I can slide it anywhere on that line. Just kind of fly my tarp for the most coverage that I need. Because blowing on that end, I get more on this end. So real quick and easy, up and down. Now, this is a quick disconnect where you snatch it and it just comes out. With a, a timber hitch on that side, that's a quick disconnect as well. So if the wind and the rain has worked it and that knot's got blood tight, no matter what, I can just snatch it, it's going to come off the tree. 
real quick and easy. Now, the tarts. Connection like this allows me to slack it, and all I gotta do is grab that toggle and pull. And it will pull the line up from the bottom and just come on. So I can take my tarp off the wheel and leave my toggle in place. Suppose I want to set this up not as a tarp like this, as a diamond, but I want to make it like a puff tee. All I gotta do is just address the whatever grommet and set it up and stake it to the ground. I got a puff tee. I can also take it and hook one end of the tree, hook the spruce to this, pull it out and make a diamond shelter really quick. So my one ridge line now works for a stationary, two kinds of stationary tents and two types of tarps in one line. These stay attached. I don't have to hunt them or find out what they are. And with this toggle, I can hook anything with a grommet. I can put a military poncho on here. I can put a much bigger tarp on. I can put my smaller tarp on. It doesn't matter as long as I've got this connection system. It locks to any of them. It, I think of it kind of like the quick connect check on air tools. As long as I got the line provide, what tool do I need? I can also hook other devices to this. Now, this Prusk, which is just a standard Prusk, and all I've done to create this I took a bite of line, folded it around, did a overhand knot, and made that loop up top. And the re remaining piece of line about this long, I just started tying knots, one on top of the other. Until I got a big enough toggle that I wanted, about two inches. And then I just went back over itself, so I ended up in the middle, so you got a T. That way, when you put it through that loop, like that, if you put it halfway, when it pulls tight, like that, it's not going to go through that hole. But all I got to do is just slack it and yank, and it'll pop right off. If it's going to be severe, I have to lock it. There's no reason this can ever come off. I'm going to put that loop up through there, and I'm going to put the entire toggle through it sideways. That way, when it cinches up, there's absolutely no way that's going to go back to that grommet. Period. It weighs nothing, and it stays on the line. Now, these proofs can also be used for other things, as I was teaching the gentleman down there a while ago. Suppose I want to tie off to something that's slick, a real slick type of tree. And no matter how I put my line on it, it wants to slide down the tree. That's where one of these comes in. All I'm going to do is go up to a tree and I take some more paracord if I need to and generate a proof and just do a proof around the tree and hook to my ridge line underneath it. Now my ridge line cannot slide down it. Like I'm trying to hook up to a steel pole or something like that, where there's nothing to grip. It will not slide then because this will draw tighter with the load. This type of knot and the timber hitch are a constriction knot. They draw tighter the greater the load. Until the material breaks, it will just get tighter and tighter and tighter. Provided that you have some form of traction. Now this gnarly tree that I was trying, there's these hollow spots in it as you saw. So when I tied my knot, my knot was in this hollow spot right here. You know it's going to slip. So you got to kind of be mindful of that. Other than that, you can just adjust it as necessary. Okay, the last point I want to bring up is not about target or something. And I had mentioned it earlier, and it's a mindset about how it's impossible to be lost. Okay? If you make one little provision ahead of time, being lost simply means that I have lost my spatial awareness. I don't know where this is. I know where I'm at. I'm here. But where's here? I don't know where the piece fits. Well, how you beat that is, let's say I'm going to come to this part, or I'm going out west, or I'm going wherever, and I'm going to a, a patch of woods. Only by crashing on an aircraft can you end up someplace you don't have a clue where you're at. Because you got here, you drove in, you're going hiking here, whatever. So what you need to do as homework ahead of time is you look at a map. It doesn't have to be a topo map. It can be simply a road map. Because I know I'm driving in on this highway and I'm going to park here at this trailhead. Now look at the map and you know that up here 
north of us, about five miles up, there's a major highway going this way. On the right-hand side right here, there's a river. On the west-hand side, there's a train track. To the south side, there's another highway. You can't get lost. All you have to do is go in a straight line in any direction, and you're going to hit it, right? I boxed you. I put you in a box. Now, this box may be 20 miles across, but I'm in a box. But I don't have a compass. I've got in here, and I've got completely turned around. I don't have a clue. Here in our south, the idea of the trees growing more on one side is a little hanky because our forests are so thick. But here's the one thing you can take no matter what and understand. The sun, as it passes along our horizon, is in the southern hemisphere. It's at the equator, let's say. So any shadow you see at any time of day is in a northerly direction. Now, to make that, we're going to use this V right here to illustrate this point. At sunrise, the sun is here in the east, and the shadow it's going to cast is up here in the northwest. As the sun moves along, this shadow is going to move along. And at sundown, it's pointing to the northeast. So that means if I see any shadow and I go in the direction that the shadow is pointing, I'm hitting in roughly a northern direction. Not true north, but somewhere between northwest and northeast, right? I need to go south. That road is south. Turn around. If the sunlight is hitting you, you're hitting south. No matter where it is in this arc. So I've taken the compass and cut it in half for you. If I need to go north, follow any shadow. If I need to go south, face in any direction where the sunlight's hitting me and I can look right there's the sun. If I have to turn around and look like that, I'm going in the wrong direction toward the sun, ain't I? Sun's over here, sun's over there. Anywhere in between, I'm heading roughly south at any time of the day. So if I've done my homework and I've boxed myself in, I know how to get out of the box. It may be bad. It may be a 20 mile hike through rough stuff, but I know I can get out. Mechanical injury. I got in here, life's going great. I'm trying to find this and I fall into a hole and I break a leg. There's an event that happens, there's a, there's a occurrence that happens here in the south where you have planted pine trees and a pine tree dies due to disease or whatever and it decays and disappears and you have this carpet of pine straw and these regularly planted pine trees you're walking along and then there's this gap between two trees and there's nothing there there may be the pine straw may have covered the hole and you're walking along and you step in a hole that's four and a half foot deep in that big in diameter and you go clean to your hip but in the forward action forward of following, it snapped the top of your back. You used to see this a lot years ago with timber people, where they would step in what was called a chuck hole, and it would break your leg. Now what you going to do? If you're smart, you've left a note with people to let them know where you're at. You've left a note on your vehicle telling them where you're at, or an idea where you're going. And the last thing is you've got a cell phone or some way you can call for help to guide people to you. Barring that, what I recommend you do is absolutely never, ever, ever, ever go in the woods without at least two forms of fire making ability. Get a fire going, a big fire. Drag up as much as you can and generate as much smoke as you can. This idea of setting signal fires for aircraft to see is kind of a fallacy because they got to be looking for it, and the smoke doesn't have time to get up there, especially in our woods. We have a thermal layer problem here. The smoke will go up 25, 30, maybe 50 feet, and it hits the layer and starts going sideways. It stops going up. There's a thermal climb up there. But the thing is, here in our south, every piece of land you can name, even state parks, is owned by somebody generate a big enough fire with enough smoke there's going to be a landowner showing up wanting to know why is his woods on fire. Don't burn his woods. Generate the smoke. And nine times out of ten, and if you're in the National Forest, guarantee somebody's going to show up. What is all this smoke? They're coming to you. You can't crawl, you can't go far. Generate the smoke. Bring them to you. 
And my final thing, I'll pass on to you my moment. And I told this a couple years ago. Um, when I was a young man, a member of the family had passed away. And they had had a big hunk of land that had been a farmland, but it growed up. And the family had told me, since I loved to camp and fish and hunt, that I could use that land to kind of keep an eye on the land. And I was excited about it. So I drove about an hour, and this is in January. I drove about an hour to get to the land. And it's surrounded by forest and timberland. The old canny road getting down to it, there's grass growing up to the canny road. That's how much it ever goes on on this road. And I got to the house and I pulled around back and I parked my truck. And my interest in it being in January was not in hunting. I remember there was a 10 acre lake on this land. I want to find that lake. So I'm cutting down the trails and everything's overgrown. And as I'm trying to move in and the sun is going down and I'm looking around, I thought I caught through the, the, the light, the reflection of water, light on water, that little flicker effect. And so I started trying to cut across it. And I went, all oh, this is planted pines and it's upgrowed and everything else. And I went to step through this thick block of undergrowth and the ground fell out from under me. And I fell, I fell 10 foot down into a sinkhole that was the size of an 18 wheel trail. There was about two inches of water in the bottom of it it's just carved out. You could literally drop an 18-wheeler trailer into that hole. I could look up, and there was a hole about 12 feet up, about that big round. And there's nobody here, and there's nobody coming. No one's going to find you. You just disappear. You freak out. You have your kicking, screaming, mad minute. Get it out of your system, and then you find a way out. The only thing I had on me was a locked back pocket knife. The 45 ACP I had ain't gonna do much. But with that locked back pocket knife, I went to carving steps in the wall until I could get up and start carving out the ceiling. And about 11 o'clock that night, I reached out and managed to grab a hold of the limb and I crawled out of that hole. And that was the most terrifying walk in my life, trying to walk back to the car in that moonlight. Sure, the next step the ground was just gonna open up, you're gonna fall in. I never went back to that land. To this day, I still don't go back to that land. Things happen, real things. Stepping in a chuck hole, breaking your leg. Stepping into that sinkhole. You're gonna be going out in these places and make sure you've got some sort of documentation. People got an idea how to find you. Better yet, don't go alone. Get a buggy, drag him. Especially if you're in bear country, get somebody fatter and slower running than you. Find a way. That ain't good. Get out and enjoy it. But the basic concept of if I know what the land is boxed, I know that any shadow means north and any sunlight means south, roughly. If I just keep going roughly in that direction, I'm going to hit whatever this exit point is. I will get out. Any questions, guys? Thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's the question? You can't help not a bear. That's the reason you take somebody slower and fatter. <laughs> <laughs>